going to get to our Bible study, which is for the second Sunday in Lent. <laughs> we got there. <laughs> Here we are, the second Sunday in Lent. <coughs> That's a kind of odd lesson to begin the second Sunday in Lent. Um, it's actually the story of Abram, not Abraham quite yet, but Abram. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you. and will make you exceedingly numerous. And Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, and as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. And I will bless her, and she will give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. I'm going to stop the share for a moment because I, there's a point we need to make here. What was last week's first lesson? Do you remember? Noah. Noah. Yeah. And what did, what, what, did what, what Noah and then he put the what? The bow in the heavens, right? And, yes. And what did he say about that bow in the heavens? This is what? A a sign. But covenant. what kind of a sign? A covenant. A covenant. Oh. We got one covenant with Noah. And now we have another covenant with Abraham. Suddenly we're getting all this covenant language. What did Jesus say at the Last Supper? Yeah, it's a covenant. Take another this covenant. and drink from it, for this is a new covenant in my blood. <clears throat> You see, so this is what's building up here. This is part of our Lenten reflection that we're building up this notion of covenant theology. Kind of cool. But also notice something else that happens. Notice something else that happens. What happens when a covenant happens in this case? passes through history yeah but i mean just just in the story something happens their names change names changed their identity changes <clears throat> they're new people he went from abram to abraham she went from sarai to sarah and we could get into all the hebrew ramifications of that we won't do that but just the, the idea that you take on a new identity when you enter a covenant with God. What happens at the Easter vigil? You're baptized and you take on it. We baptize. And what? And well, we don't have any baptisms, but what, what do we do? We renew our baptismal promises and we renew our baptismal covenant. Covenant. And in theory, back in the day, you know, when 
when the great vigil of Easter was the day for a baptism and converts were brought into the church after a long catechumenate and all that stuff, they took on a new name. They put off their pagan names and they took on Christian names. See, there, so this, all of this symbolism is happening here. So this idea of we put on a new person, and that's really what our Lenten observance is supposed to be somewhat about, is we put off the old person, the old um, attachments. We try through our disciplines to put off the old attachments and take on a new way of doing things, which is the it, the disciple, the identity of being a disciple of Christ. When you were ordained a priest in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. did they give you a new name? No, that happens for religious or vowed religious, not for secular priests. So you're, if you're a, a member of a particular monastic community, yeah, like a Franciscan or a Benedictine or something like that. So, for example, if I actually the practice now is really not to do that anymore. But in the day and 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 women religious do the same thing. For example, uh, my teachers when I was growing up, it would be Sister Mary John Vianney or something like that. It was they would take on the name of a patron saint rather than keep their their baptismal name because they would put off the old person. They would become someone else. Some of the ritual still is there. For example, when I was ordained, we lay prostrate on the ground. And the idea was, and in fact, my mother picked up on it. She, when I, uh, during the, the recitation or the singing of the Litany of the Saints, which was part of our, our ordination ritual, we would we would lay prostrate on the ground. And I was ordained singularly. I was ordained alone. So it was all kind of focused on me. And so I just, you know, laid down on, on the floor and the litany was sung over me. It takes a long time. It's like 11 minutes long. And um, she just started crying. And, you know, I was right near, I mean, I was in the center aisle and they were in the first pew and I heard her crying. And afterwards, I said, Mom, while you were crying, she said, "It because it felt like you were dying. And I, I kind of smiled to myself. I didn't laugh at her. I didn't. But I mean, be, I smiled to myself because that's exactly what it's supposed to be. You're dying to self. See, and then the old observance, the old rituals of Holy Week, the litany of saints, of the saints was sung at the Easter Vigil. And that was the idea was that the old self was being put off. And in the old rituals of the baptism, uh, particularly baptisms of adults, you took your clothes off and you went into the, in, into the baptismal pool naked. Mm -hmm. And then you came out and you were vested in a white robe. And the idea was you were you 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 were totally changed. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So that and this all happened outside the view of the congregation. So in the really really old churches, you you had separate baptistries. You know, the, a lot of bell towers and really ancient churches, particularly in the Mediterranean, the warmer climes. Quite frankly, mm -hmm. uh, you would have bell towers, but the bell towers were actually the baptistries the lower level of the bell towers were the baptistries. And because then this was all done outside the vision of the, of the uh, congregation, because women particularly were attended to by deaconesses. They were attended to by other women for obvious reasons. If they're going to go naked down into the, into the baptismal font, the men were not going to be there except for the priest. And, you know, so they were, would be baptized and then they would be, uh, they would come up and they would be shrouded 
uh, with, a, with a sheet to be drawn off and then they would be vested in a white robe. And it was this white robe then that they wore through the next Sunday, low Sunday. And they wore this robe theoretically until Pentecost. And what's the nickname for Pentecost, George, in, 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 in Anglican speak? Well, Come on, it's old prayer book language here. Whit well, Sunday. <laughs> white Sunday. White Sunday, because that's the day they got to take off the white robe and they became theoretically full disciples because they were no longer neophytes. All through the 50 days of Pentecost season, they were undergoing what was called the mystagogia, the final phase of their teaching. They were fully baptized. They were full members of the church, but they were undergoing yet another formational process, educational process. They were undergoing what was called the mystagogia. They were, ent they were entering into the final phases. They were admitted to communion. They, you know, they were now uh, allowed to stay for the full liturgy and all this kind of stuff. For 50 days, they did this. And on Whit Sunday, Pentecost Day, they finally were able to take off their white robes. And they were no longer, you know, pointed out as neophytes, as new newbies. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they still do that in uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church. Yeah, 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 yeah. My, uh, my sister, uh, her sister in law, that is Eastern Orthodox, and they had triplets. Uh -huh. And my sister was one of the dressers for the babies. Uh -huh. And after they baptized them naked, and then they slather them in oil, and then you're supposed to dress them in new clothes. A squirming, squirming baby in oil yeah. that's oily. Yep, 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 yep. Well, we see, and, and because in the East, they've never separated the con what we call confirmation away from the baptism. That That's you're actually something right that away. happened in the West. Yeah, you're giving your first communion when you're baptized. Yeah, all three sacraments. They're called the sacraments of initiation. Baptism, mm -hmm. Eucharist, and confirmation are all happening at the same time. In the Episcopal Church, we've restored the chrismation to baptism. That's why... At the end, you know, I've talked about it already in church where we 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 use chrism um, and we we anoint the baby's head, particularly if they're a baby, well, anoint anybody's head, but when we're even a baby, we will anoint the baby's head and say, You are marked out as Christ's own. We're using chrism, which is the same oil that would have been used at confirmation. But uh, when the bishop confirms in the Episcopal Church, the, they do not anoint. Now, in the Roman Church, they anoint. But in the uh, Episcopal Church, they do not anoint. They simply impose hands. Hmm. Because the anointing has already occurred at baptism, and it's considered to be redundant. Hmm. Hmm. So the anointing in that sense of the anointing with the Holy Spirit happens at baptism. So it's a restoration of that ancient practice. And also in theory, that's why we don't kind of have this notion of a first communion in the Episcopal church like they do in the Roman church, because the idea is whenever the parents feel that the child is ready to receive, they should receive whenever. The only thing we want is the child to understand that this is not simply a, a cookie or a piece of bread or something, that there's something sacred going on. That's the only thing that we want. So it's uh, theoretically, uh, if the child, if the parents want the baby to receive uh, First Communion early, early, they, they can. There isn't any... Uh, the Roman practice is very different. In fact, that's why uh, when my mother, for example, was a child, she was not able to receive communion. And then that was the practice in the Episcopal Church and, and, and in the Church of England for a very long time. You couldn't receive communion until you were confirmed. And you weren't confirmed until like the age of 12 or so. But that it was in the beginning of the 20th century that I think it was Pope, uh, Pope Pius X instituted what was called uh, 
early communion, uh, that as soon as the child reached the what was called the age of reason, around the age of seven or so, that they could receive Holy Communion. In other words, if they could discern that this was something special, something sacred, that they could receive Holy Communion. And that's only in the 20th century, mm. early 20th mm. century. So that's why children could then receive Holy Communion. And then they were confirmed later. So it was reversed. And then, then so suddenly confirmation became, later on in the 20th century, we used to joke in the Roman church, it became a sacrament in search of a theology because it no longer was this completion of initiation. It was this sort of amorphous sacrament. Um, and then it became a rite of passage into adulthood and then all kinds of other things. And so it's still kind of out there. Uh, uh, so we're we've sort of restored it back into uh, into uh, baptism, but not really. So we still got this thing about the bishop being the minister of it. Because um, interesting in the Catholic Church, canonically, um, a priest can confirm with the permission of the bishop, but in the Episcopal Church, you can't do that because the idea is that it's the bishop who finishes the job of bringing someone into the church. Hmm. Because in theory, that's what it, how it always was. Well, we're getting off on a tangent there, but that's <laughs> that. this is the beginning. This notion of covenantal theology is then underlying what we actually get into about the covenant of Christ's cross, which is then instituted into the covenant of the Eucharist, and also underlies our baptismal covenant. So that's kind of what's going on here with the scriptures. But we get into to the Gospel of Mark. We'll go back to it. Jesus began to teach his disciples, but the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this all quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and he said to them, if any want to be my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give, their, give them in return for their life? For those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of the Father with the holy angels. Notice that's the eighth chapter of Mark. We went from the first chapter of Mark to the eighth chapter of Mark in a week. <laughs> Pretty good. We're halfway through already. Yeah. <laughs> More than halfway through. Well, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're jumping now into Jesus' prediction of his crucifixion. But not really, sort of. What he's talking about here is what? What, what is the core concept, Christian concept here? Take up your cross. Take up your cross, which is the core concept of what? I would say sacrifice or uh, renunciation to your rights in some fashion. Okay. Which is at the heart of what? What are we really talking about here? Why do you take up your cross? To do what? To do God's will in the world. But why, why? What is that will? It, don't overthink it. What's it? What does it say in the text? Well, that 
particular phrase um, interested me when he said, uh, take up your cross. We think of the physical cross that he was forced to take up on his way to his death. And it would seem that that might be pretty hard for them to accept, but it must be what he means because I can't think of any other cross that they would pick up uh, uh, like we have small crosses to uh, symbolize uh, his cross. So um, that's a pretty tough message that he's giving. If he's saying, uh, take up your cross because you're going to be nailed to it someday. I'm not so sure about that, George, though. And I'm not trying to rationalize my way out of that. But that the, the implication of that is God wills us all to suffer. Is that what we want to say to people? Because I'm not sure that's true. No, because we're, we're supposed to alleviate suffering in the world. Or, you know, to help, you know, do <clears throat> to give to the poor and, to, you know, to Look, look again at the text. Look at what does the text say? It says, take up your cross and follow me. Follow me. Walk in, what does following mean? Walk in my footsteps. Follow my path. What is the way? See, there's that, that, there is that word again that is used all through early Christianity. The way. Mm -hmm. We are followers of the way. That was the first name. Exactly. So what is the way of Jesus? And the implication in this phrase seemed to be that there's something we have to leave behind and something to take over. Mm -hmm. Something that we need to leave behind. Because for some reason, it will not be healthy. Sacrifice. But sacrifice, again, is that sort of like, oh, oh I, you know... Mm -hmm. I got to burn up something, my house or something, you know. But look at this thing. Think of this idea of covenant again. Noah left behind everything that Noah knew, took on board the ark, all that God told him to take with him, and God gave him a new world. And Abraham did the same with the Abraham culture he left behind. Picked up from Ur of Chaldees and went up to Canaan. From what we know, the culture in which Abraham was raised was one of the richest and one of the most powerful of its time. Mm -hmm. And instead, he chose, because there was some kind of revelation, to leave behind all that rich wonderful culture to meander in the desert. But he was still a rich man. He had all these flocks and cattle and he took everything with him. He didn't give anything up. And in fact, he didn't have any children. God told him to have a child, you know, with his wife's handmaid. And then because he was seemingly listening to God, God said, okay, let's take the next step. Let, let's make your ancient wife fertile. 
which brought a smile to old. her face. Pardon me? George? <laughs> which made her laugh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so God said, I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly Isaac came along. And then, of course, there's there's that there's another etiological legend that emerges from that. You have Ishmael and Isaac, and so you get the Semite peoples that are divided. You have the Arabs and you know blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. But you know, there's but there's there, there is the there is the there is the mythology there. There's there's Abraham, and then you have Sarah, and you have Hagar. And all of that is all there, but you have this notion of listening to the word of God, following the will of God. And, you know, that's the core, isn't it? Of, I mean, that's the core of Islam. That's the, the notion of Islam is following the will of God. It is God's will. And so that's the, the core idea of the whole Semite ethos, whether you're Jewish or, or not, or, or, or Arab. And this is inculcated on, almost genetically into the whole idea. And so this comes along. The covenant is struck between Abraham and God. And so a new life emerges. And then, of course, the history is what it is. And then we get this new thing. Then we have the Exodus covenant, which comes later. And then you have the Davidic monarchy. There's another covenant that's struck there, where you actually have the kingdom covenants. And then you have this new covenant with Jesus. And Jesus says, here's the covenant. Follow me. But what is this covenant? What is the way? You can put it very succinctly. Following Jesus. Yeah, but what is that way? Come on, you right one people. The way based hint, on hint, hint. love of God and ah. love of your neighbor. Yeah. Uh -huh. What is the greatest commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And there is a second commandment. It is like unto it, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and all the, the law. So we can even summarize it even further. Love one another. Love, love. As I have loved you. That's why it's take up your cross and follow me. Yeah. I have loved you to the end. I would like to complicate matters a little bit. Go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in the sense of following Jesus, in my experience, means that I have to renew our vi my vision over and over. Mm -hmm. That is, I can understand what Jesus wants me to do now, but then maybe tomorrow I have to reconsider it and <clears throat> think again, what does this mean in this case? And and I have to renew the covenant periodically to remind myself, well, the way I have chosen to live is this way and not this other way. And I have to repent precisely because sometimes I get out of the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's that dimension of renewal, of reminding us of... Um, of um, you know, we need to reconsider. I'm sorry. There's somebody asking me about pizza, and uh... 
<laughs> okay, good. <laughs> That's for so. That's for lunch. Um, but one of the things is that I am not the same person I was five or ten years ago, yeah. and my situation is different. So yeah. I need to consider to renew. I go to church and to some special services precisely because I need to be reminded that maybe I need to reconsider a different. A different angle of mm -hmm. my life or a different Hence, way of doing things. It is the way. That's why I was doing this hand gesture because we are constantly in motion. Mm -hmm. We never stop. Right. right. See, again, it goes back to this idea of constantly returning to be fed by sacrament and word even though we hear the same word, mm -hmm. the same scriptures, the same prayers. But each time we come back, we are different. And sometimes we have a phrase that we have heard numerous times and all of a sudden make more sense to be that day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But because we are, the, the fancy word is peripatetic disciples. Jesus never stayed in one place very long. Jesus was always on the move. And that's why the Jews have as a practice Passover, for example, in which mm -hmm. children and family members are reminded of the works of God. Um, but the other dimension to complicate a little bit more was as you were talking about your ordination. I always remember I was visiting Portugal and I was talking to the, at that point, Bishop of the Methodist Church in Portugal. And he was telling the, the team I was with about an ordination at one of the cathedrals in Porto. And it was a Catholic ordination. Mm -hmm. And what struck him at that point was, I am witnessing the cloud of witnesses that through the mm -hmm. centuries have gone through this process. So Christianity is not just about me, it's about mm -hmm. the great cloud of witnesses like Noah and Abraham and others before me that had reminded me of God working in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That liturgically, for example, that's one of the reasons for the why we did the Litany of the Saints was to call to witness what is happening here, all those that have gone before. That that's exactly the case is that it is, you know, we, 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 we profess in our creeds, we believe in the communion of saints. And the, the most ancient understanding of that is a tripartite understanding of the church triumphant, the church militant, and the church suffering. And the church triumphant are the saints in heaven, the church militant being the church as it exists in the world as it is now, and the church suffering, depending on your theology, uh, is the church in transition, the church that is on the way to becoming the church triumphant. So that when you're, when we're, you know, chanting this, this litany, that's why it goes on for so long, is the idea is that you're lost in this, as you said, the cloud. That's why it's supposed to be a long litany, because you're not you're not supposed to be remember the beginning, and you're not you're waiting for the end to come, and it doesn't quite come when you're expecting. So that you you get to the point where it's just this sort of sing songy thing that happens, and you get lost in it. it's it's a mantra, and it becomes this 
and you just get lost in this thing and you you lose a sense of time and you lose a little bit of a sense of place and it's everybody the people who are chanting it the people who are laying on the floor the people you know and the idea is that you're calling the whole church to witness this moment because it is thought in the life of the church to be a significant moment. And it wasn't only, as I mentioned before, it wasn't only at ordination. This was also in, in that same era was done at baptism. So that when you had, you know, baptism at the Easter vigil, which was the consummate moment for baptism, that you were doing the same thing. You were blessing, calling the spirit down over the baptismal waters and all of this thing that, you know, you were just, you know, it was this uh, mystical experience. Well, Kathy missed the conversation about the glass windows we have in the church. But mm -hmm. if you look around, you have the names of those witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> because in some of those windows, there are names associated with the window. Yeah. Well, and, and I, of, of numerous people that probably, I don't know, I don't know them, or yeah. I might have known them by reference. Well, and I preached there. a sermon on our All Saints Day and All Souls Day uh, at our um, Requiem Mass several years ago about the stones in the church and how the stones themselves witnessed, have witnessed generations of baptisms and weddings and funerals and uh you know liturgies and communions and all, all of the actions that have taken place and that this and i the, the title of the sermon was the stones cry out and give witness to the faith that has been lived in this building mm -hmm. and that we on that day on that requiem we are remembering it was we did the rudder requiem that day and that, you know, that was about the second or third year that I was here, that we, that, that, um, that these stones cry out in witness to over a hundred years of faith lived out here in real people's real lives. And we remember those people today, you know, whether we know their names or not, but their spirits are here. Not in a ghostly way. I don't mean that, you know, that they're haunting the place, but rather they join us in the great communion of saints. I mean, that's what we were celebrating that day. And we we quickly forget that. You know, we 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 kind of get caught up in this overly uh I would say overly lacked, uh, lacking, overly lacking sense of mystery mm. about what we do. We can get very pedantic about it, very um, intellectual, very um, almost clinical, and forget that this is a mystery. We're talking about God, <laughs> you know, and 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 God is mysterious. Yeah, I was just looking through the. Um ordination service and they don't have anything like that in the it's it's very can i say nuts and bolts well that's thank you you know thank you to the great reformers of the continent <laughs> <laughs> i mean even you know for example i was talking uh, before about i forgot what context we were talking about but you know the the anointing with the oil and the hands and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know yeah. that I had the privilege of having that experience, where, you know, having my hands slathered with chrism, and then having them cleaned off. But you know you can't get it all out. So the rest of that liturgy, when I was ordained, you smell the balsam on your hands. So I mean, you know, you're changed. You're different because you you know you, you have your hands in the orange position and it's you know you know the the aroma is is, is all around you 
And I had a bishop. <laughs> he's an amazing guy. He was, he was like six five and built like. Ugh. And his hands, when when he went to like impose hands, his hands went from here to the back of my head. It was like my <laughs> hands. And his hands. I mean, you talk about feeling like you died. <laughs> it was, the imposition of hands was dramatic. Trust me. And he and he had because he was that tall, and he was very. I mean, he was an old. He was. Uh, I was ordained in 1981, a priest, and um, I was uh, ordained alone. And, and and because he was so tall, and he had been a bishop for a while, so he had the old mitres, and you know, he had, his ceremonial mitre was yay tall. So you can imagine, you know, a, a, a mitre that was over like I've been 14, 15, 16 inches tall on top of a man who's already six five. You know, he looked like a guided missile coming at you, you know, and then these wow. immense hands coming on top of you. It was impressive, trust me. You knew something was going on. Um, <laughs> I was about to say. You know, and after the, you know, that was after the litany of the saints and all that kind of stuff in his hands. And he went and, and he made sure that he like imposed hands. He wasn't gentle about it. He put his hands on your head and he pressed down and you know and and toward the end of the time and he, he kept them there for a while and he would just give you this little you know bounce when he was done and you know and then he, he would take his hands off and his uh uh the mc who was his executive secretary monsignor Papadik, would come along and he would just and he whispered in my ear father i was because i had been a deacon so you know he didn't call you father and he would, Father, may I have your stole? Because they would take your deacon stole off and give you, and then you would stand up and be vested as a priest. And he would, Father, may I have your stole? And boy, that just comes over you. Like, you know, you, your life has changed. It's like that, your name will no longer be Abram. It will be Abraham. That's the experience you go through at that point. It says, your life has changed forever. And, you know, and because, you know, in both in, Roman theology and in Anglican theology, you are a priest. And even though you may be defrocked, you know, because you've committed a horrible crime or something, and the church may, you know, sort of dismiss you out of the clerical state, that is a canonical status. You never lose your, your, the mark of your ordination from a theological point of view. You are, quote unquote, a priest forever. And that is, Something, for example, like even in the Roman Church, uh, even though I am persona non grata and all that kind of stuff, because I left the church, and you know, all that, uh, if I come across say, an accident scene, I can still hear someone's confession, and I can still absolve them of their sins, and I can still anoint them and bestow an apostolic blessing if they are what's called in extreme, in um, mortis extremis. In other words, they're in danger of of death. The, the, the church still recognizes my authority and my power as a priest for the sake of someone's salvation. That's that's how serious that is. So the Roman Church, I mean, you know, we're not we're not you know the Episcopal Church. We're not so canonical. About Anyway, um, so when we talk, start go, go back to the gospel, when we're talking about this notion of the way, Carmen's comments are critical here. It's not a static thing. Discipleship is not simply membership in a church. It's not simply a status that we get because we don't get baptized or something like that. It is a continual process. So that's one of the things that Folks don't really kind of get a lot of times. And so they'll worry about getting the kid baptized, for example, getting a baby baptized. And then suddenly we never see them. You know, that, so that's a total misunderstanding. I mean, I tried to talk to my mother-in-law about this, you know, because she is hell-bent on getting, you know, one of the members of our family, um, the baby, gotta get the baby baptized, you know, because all that kind of stuff. 
And I'm trying to say that you know, they don't go to church. They're not going to raise the children as Christians. They themselves are not disciples. They just, they just don't understand. You know, she's very Catholic and, you know, very got that Catholic mentality about limbo and all that sort of thing. And I tried to even explain it to her from a Roman Catholic point of view that the Catholic Church doesn't really believe that kind of stuff. You know, that an innocent child is not going to be condemned to hell and all that kind of thing. But, you know, it's, it's this notion that a status, in other words, what status you have, is a static thing rather than a dynamic relationship between the individual and the community and the individual, the community, and God. And it is about following. And following is itself, it's a gerund, it's a verb, it's a verb form, which, which means it's active which means there has to be action somehow tied up in this. And in this context, as Jesus says, take up your cross, then all the other things we mentioned about sacrifice, about leaving things behind. Um, but more importantly, it's not so much the actual sort of suffering dimension of it as it is the change in life. That's the piece the new identity. And sometimes that demands sacrifice. Sometimes it demands suffering. Sometimes, but not always. It, that depends on our circumstances. Because the ultimate action word is love. And whatever the demands of love on, are in any given set of circumstances are what determines what the following determines. And like in family life, sometimes loving someone demands sacrifice. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it does. If we love someone deeply, it doesn't, it may seem like sacrifice from the ex exterior, but we seldom think of it that way. Do we? Do we dread it if we're doing it for someone we love? Being part of a community is sacrifice sometimes, especially if, because we like some people and we don't like some people. <laughs> some people <laughs> might be aggravating and some people may be nice. You know, there might be in any given community, let's say, saying, look, some people that you can relate to naturally without any trouble, and some that somehow brings out in you the worst part <laughs> or, or, or things that you don't, you know, anger or whatever. I cannot imagine that everybody in the choir will be happy all the time. There might be moments in which there will be disagreement. We are not naming names. Uh, or George, in a long life in uh, St. Luke, might have found some friends and some people that he tries to maintain at a, dif at a distance. <laughs> because he knows that. So uh, we all have to struggle with that, too. I mean, not just an intimate relationship, but in a group relationship. Um, we we have to think about how do we relate to people and, and how can we maintain peace as possible or confront as possible. That can be equally true in a small community like our family. Hmm. Even among spouses. There are days when I really don't like Ken, when he does X, Y, Z, that just annoys the living daylights out of me, and vice versa, too. Uh, to be perfectly honest, 
Uh, there, you know, there are days when we prefer not to be in each other's company. And I think we all have had those days. But because we have committed to each other, to love each other in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's when the quote unquote sacrifice comes in. That's when we take up quote unquote the cross in that particular context, in that particular relationship. And so the parallel is in larger community, in our extended family, and then grow that circle a bit more in our extended friendships, grow that circle more than in our community life, grow that circle more in our church community, grow that, you know, and you keep growing that circle, our political community, and then you grow that circle more, you know, and then the reality is that how we actually do that with each and every relationship in our network as humans is colored by the way we do that with our relationship to ourselves within, as we look within, which is itself our relationship to God. So that those two commands then suddenly are in harmony or in sync or not. George, you look yeah. eager to well, say <laughs> Well, uh, there have been times in my life when I wondered if I was loving enough. And um, because I sometimes have witnessed other families where there seems to be more external demonstration of love than I uh, gave. And in the family that I grew up, um, there was very little demonstration of love, but I, I had the feeling I knew it was there. Uh, but, um, and I'm sometimes at funerals and those at St. Luke's, a son will get up and say, my father never told me he loved me. And, um, but yet I knew he loved me. And so that I, I sometimes have wondered, have I been loving enough to my children? And, and, and uh, it's a bit of a weight, but the fact that you are concerned if you have enough love, uh, it means that uh, you do have it there, and that you 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 want it, and um, the because it makes everything better. <laughs> and, uh, with Betty and me, we we sort of made a promise that we didn't want to go to bed angry. <laughs> and sometimes we weren't up to that promise completely. And so that um, my little joke with her at night when we would go to bed was, do you still love me? <laughs> and then she'd say, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> and that turned out to be kind of a nice thing that we said to each other before we went went to bed at night that uh, we, could, we could express love almost in a humorous way because uh, we accepted it so so completely mm -hmm. but um it what but it all boils down to that is how much love do you have and uh, in, in my prayers, one of the things I ask is, you know, uh, 
give me the wisdom to know what is the right thing to do uh, and to, to be genuinely loving enough that, that I do the right thing uh, almost without having to think about it. And sometimes I discover I didn't do the right thing. And I, re I review that. Uh, and so that's when I have to ask for a little more help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of the prior practices um, in this challenge that we have in loving others um, that I have found helpful comes actually from another tradition, and that's that's from the Buddhist tradition. Um, when the Buddhist meditation uh, practice, particularly from the uh, Thai tradition, where they practice loving kindness meditation, where you begin uh, in terms of your uh, your meditation, you express loving kindness to yourself. And you recite certain phrases. May I be safe. May I be healthy. May I experience kindness. May I be at peace. Some something like that. And then you, you do this several times and you think of what what do you feel about those various things? How do you, you know, what's your body state? What's your mind state uh, in each of those states? And then you bring to mind someone whom you care for deeply, positively, and you wish the same things for that person. And so you meditate on that for a bit and you do the same thing. So I would bring someone to mind. And I said, may you be safe. May you be healthy. May you be at peace, etc." And then you bring to mind someone that you do not know somebody objective, like somebody you met, like a cashier at a store or someplace, you know, somebody sort of neutral, you know, you have no real relationship. And you do the same thing, like the barista at Starbucks movie. And then you think of someone that you're not really very friendly with. In other words, someone who has been a pain in your butt or somebody like that. Or someone you're not, you would not wish good things for generally, but you bring yourself into that same mind state and you do the same thing. That's hard. It is. Yeah. May you be at peace. Uh, may you be healthy. May you be safe. May you be at peace. May you live at ease. Because that's then answering the call of Jesus to love your enemies. And it is hard. But I have found that, put it, again, putting it in the Christian context, to challenge me into that following, taking up my cross. Because it's easy to love, didn't Jesus say this? It not it easy to love the people who love you? Don't the pagans do the same? But what I say to you is this, of those who hate you and who persecute you and utter every kind of slander against you because of me. So, you know, when I hear, sometimes when I just can spit nails because I hear a certain political figure spout something that just makes me angry, 
before I get too exercised about it. Sometimes I will go to my quiet place and I will go to a mindfulness meditation and I will pray for that person in that way. But I will go through the entire process. Going through the entire process makes it more than lip service. Because what it does is it brings you, roots you deeply into your own mind state and your own heart. Because otherwise it's just, it, it, it's too easily, well, I'll pray for them and I'll make, you know, I'll just kind of do it. But rooting it in your own mind state in order to make it real, because I've already prayed for myself, I prayed for someone I love, I prayed for someone that is sort of neutral and I just sort of brought them to mind and, and then praying for this person that I, <laughs> you know, it makes it harder actually, but then in overcoming the obstacle actually makes it more sincere and makes it more an act of love, makes it more sacrificial in that sense. Can you repeat those steps again, please? To start by offering a loving kindness or a prayer of mercy to one, for oneself, which we often actually kind of find difficult sometimes. Some people find it cheesy to pray for yourself. <laughs> you should. You know, I mean, most of us are Anglo-Saxon, like with me, throw a lot of heavy German into that, you know. It's yeah, like, I'm not worthy. Yeah, no. Yeah. You're the most worthy person you know, actually, because if you don't get it, who should? Um, <laughs> but you pray for yourself. However, whatever whatever that loving kindness means to you, whatever God's mercy means to you, uh, the, the sort of traditional Buddhist way of doing it is beginning with, may I be safe? You know, that's the first thing we want, you know, is safety. We want shelter, food, you know, those kinds of things. May you be safe. May you be healthy. We all want to be healthy. Um, may you be uh, at peace. And the last one is you need, may you live at ease. What that really means is may you be, may you live at ease is like um, be at ease with other people around you, you know, living at a, peace is usually about an inward peace. May you live at ease as being at peace with others. You, Say that about yourself. And then you think of someone, um, and, and these two can be in either order. You can think of someone who's um, who's objectively neutral, someone you just met maybe, or someone you met in the grocery store like the clerk or uh, someone you saw on a street corner. You know, just somebody you don't really know. You have no relationship. With. Like the barista at Starbucks. Thank you. And then someone you love, someone you care for deeply. And then moving on to someone who, you might even want to say somebody you hate <laughs> or someone who's harmed you or someone who is not one of your favorite people. But do the same identical process for each of those people. I do that every morning. And then, particularly if it's been a particularly difficult prayer time, then what I do is I do a, a prayer of gratitude in the same way. I thank you for my home, my safety, the food that I had this morning, you know, whatever thing comes to mind. I thank you for the, the person who took care of me at the store yesterday, da 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 I thank you for Ken and for what he's done for me. Da, 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 da. I thank you for the crazy person who was just on the television who made me nuts. You know, it, just... <laughs> Baltimore, he who should not, shall not be named. Yes, he should, who should not be named. Um, well, and, and, we don't want to find... name names. Say, say again. We don't want to name names. No, no. But <laughs> but but see, even that, I can find gratitude for that because it makes me think about what do I value? Mm. See, there is something to be grateful for there because it says, 
what do I hold dear? You know, what what value do 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 is being contradicted there? You know, I could talk about one of the Supreme Court justices who wrote this crazy article yesterday, you know, that came out and is like now threatening rights and so on, uh, maybe down the road, you know, that I hold dear. Now I have to think hard about what, you know, what am I going to do? What is my course of action? I need to be grateful that someone has made my awareness deep and has called me into action. That's something to be grateful for. So there it is. We're way beyond our time. Anyway. <laughs> so Jesus tells us to take up our cross and follow. So what is it going to mean for you to follow? It doesn't mean, again, I'm going to kind of push back a little bit on George's original comment about it means to suffer. That, I think, is one of the things that Christians get picked on the most. Is that this cross thing is about us trying to nail ourselves to the cross, you know, so, so that, you know, somehow we're all supposed to, you know, and, and nobody does it. So therefore we get this, you know, we're a bunch of hypocrites. No, it doesn't mean that. It means follow me in my way of life. And my way of life ends up being this path, the way. But what is the way? And I think the way is, as we've mapped out, the way of, as, as, as uh, Bishop Curry has taught us so eloquently over these many years, the way of love. Sometimes that is the cross. But sometimes it's many other things. And I would affirm what George has said in the sense that sometimes, like you have described, loving someone contains suffering in the sense of, I don't necessarily like to pray for some people. <laughs> and yet because of the call and the commitment to follow Christ, I tried to pray for them. Yes, yes. So yes. in that sense, it's suffering sometimes. Yeah. There are elements to it, but it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, putting ourselves in front of a truck or something like that, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, then, thank you. Um, it'd be lovely to see you this evening um, at our soup supper, but I know everybody can't be there. So um, take care. Sure. Won't be with you next week, but I know you'll be. You're going to be in a warm place next I week. I will. I will be in a warm place, having fun, okay. enjoy. <laughs> and Kathy will be in a couple of weeks in a warm yes. place as well. But you know, we'll be like ships in the night or planes in the night. <laughs> so take care. Um, Do you have a real quick minute? Sure. Sure. Let me stop the recording and.